What is up, fellow thermonuclear AFers? I am Dan Favalli, dropping another NBA team look ahead for 22-23. We are on to the Boston Celtics, which means, if you listened to this podcast before, you know that I'm going to talk to Alex Kungu, fantastic NBA follow. Follow him on Twitter at Kungu underscore NBA. That's at K-U-N-G-U underscore NBA. He does a great job talking and covering not just the Celtics, but the entire league. He's very insightful when he does decide to post his takes on Twitter. So I appreciate him always taking the time to speak with me. My one of my many questions for this podcast though, Alex, and the most important one, how the heck are you doing? Doing well, man. Doing well. Uh can't complain. Uh all circumstances aside, it was it's been good to have two preseason games against the Hornets. I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a shame more of those games will come against uh, will come against the Hornets. Uh, so I, I think the place to start is just: Do you have any thoughts that you wanted to convey about the Ime Udoka <laughs> suspension situation, and then the decision to name Joe Mazzulla as the the interim head coach? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was obviously like everyone else. It was pretty crazy to just see that kind of just spill like a week before the preseason. Um, I think. This year is probably not the year it's going to infect them. Really, it'll be next year to see what you what you Doka staff is going to what Udoka staff is going to go. Mm-hmm. Um, I know, I know guys like Damon Stoudemire, Ben Sullivan, Aaron Miles, Tony Dobbins all have very high ranks around the league. Um, Brad immediately came out and hired Joe Mazzulla, who who just mentioned, um, who was you know the the one the one member from his coaching staff that was that remains. Um, he stayed there. Udoka had a whole new team. Now Udoka's gone, and Brad put appoints him as a coach. So I don't know what that means for the rest of the assistants if they'll stay. Uh, but I think those contributions um, next year and stuff like that, I think that's where we'll really start to see the impact. Because right now there's still a lot of familiarity in the coaching staff uh, place. But as 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 for Udoka, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Like like everyone else, we don't know. So. Um, just hoping that the people that were affected by that are in a better place. And it's all, it's, it's all you can really say about it. Yeah, that is all you can say. And we actually rescheduled this um, because we were, we're going to record like the day after that the suspension came down. And it was, I think, the only takes to really, because we still don't know the full details. And I don't know that we should <laughs> because that involves giving people's names out. And as we saw, um, speculation on Twitter is already bad when we don't know who it is. I can't imagine that. Um, the female employee involved, she faced more harassment, but so there was just the response there was irresponsible reporting in the way that things were framed as well. It went from, you know, the power dynamic was potential power dynamic was ignored to it was consensual to allegedly consensual. So that stuff is tough to grapple. And I think the one thing that you can maybe analyze is it feels like the Celtics don't or d- don't expect, don't want him or don't expect him to come back. How do you suspend someone for a year? and just think this is going to blow over. And then there's the reporting that they support um, other teams that want to inquire about him feels very much like we don't expect this guy to be back, but we're trying to figure out if we have grounds to fire him just yet. Yeah, that's my, that, that, that's my initial take too. Um, <clears throat> Cause to not fire him, but then to still be leaking out, I think even Walter reported that they were open to teams who wanted to maybe interview him or get more information about it. So right. if you're doing stuff like that, you know, that's not a guy that you plan on keeping. Um, and so I agree with you on the continuity. I guess just only does it become something that be- is a distraction just in general, um, becomes a bigger storyline sometime. There is actual basketball, lots of basketball questions to talk about with this team. And I'd be remiss, though, if I didn't ask you since we haven't spoken, is there just sort of any arcing themes, concerns, sentiments you have from their finals loss to the Warriors that are sticking with you entering the, the regular season this year? Mm, I, I would say just 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 a general feeling of like it takes it's very hard to get to the finals. A lot of stuff has to go your way and you don't know if you're ever going to be back. So it's more it's more of that feeling. But I do feel like, you know, the way the season progressed and how they played, it did look like they just ran out of gas at the end. And that's understandable. I mean, in large part, it was their fault for, you know, sucking for 60 percent of the regular season. Um, and then having to go as hard as they had to go yeah, to get point. to that seating. Um, so that's maybe something, something that they can learn and take from. But, you know, there's no promise that they'll get back. And that's probably like the, the hardest point is like if you had a really great run. You beat a lot of very hard teams that I don't know if you could, if anyone could repeat that again. 
Um, so, you know, things have to go your way and maybe they don't go their way again. So that, so that's probably the biggest thing I have. <clears throat> that sticks in the back of my, my mind too now, even more so than ever, because I think there'd be a tendency to look at the Jays and say, well, they, they could be here for a while. And the windows in the NBA have just been closing so quickly lately. And the fact that they went to the finals, it's like, might they not never get, but they'll be in the conversation, but look how robust the East looks this year. And so that stuck with me too, where it's, we have a tendency to think these younger cores will be around longer than they actually end up being around. We've just seen the NBA is a shit show when it comes to that stuff. Oh yeah. I think no one can, no one should be able to project outside of their team more than three to four years. Yeah. That's just really how it is in this league now. Three to that four might even years. be ambitious if you look at the mm -hmm. Brooklyn Nets a little bit. I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah honestly. Um, so the other thing too, uh, I can't remember. I think this came out before we were slated to record the first time, but Robert Williams goes from needs a second knee procedure and it's going to be out four to six weeks to now eight to 12 is the expectation. How big of a deal is this for the Celtics, both during that span and then kind of monitoring him coming back? I mean, it's a hit. It's a huge deal. You know, as as uh, Brian Windhorst says, there's no such thing as a minor surgery. And he's had two right. of them very in very, very close times. Um, and that's a problem that's persisted him coming into the league with injuries and staying healthy. Um, so it's definitely concerning. You know, um, I think talent wise, there's no question that like when he's on the floor, like he's part of the core that you see going forward. It's just the problem is that, you know, the best skill is still availability. Mm -hmm. And right now, we don't know how available he's going to be. They said 8 to 12 until he starts, you know, getting ready to um, ramp up to begin basketball activities. So chances are we're not going to see him in the year 2022 and maybe not even before the All-Star break. Um, and it's just going to be a question of, like, is this something that is going to be continuously ongoing with him or not? Um, but history suggests that it is. So that's kind of concerning for someone that, you know, unlocks, I think, the night unlocks the thing about their defense that makes it, you know, the nightmare that it is. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, is like the real only really like really, really dangerous, like vertical spacing threat with that ability of passing um, that they have. So it's, it, it's a loss on both ends of the court. Um, and it is concerning because he does mean a lot to the team. So. The Dobe, I don't expect that being a big issue in the regular season. Um, they should be able to hold the floor for the regular season, but it will be a difference in the playoffs. It'll be a difference maker. When you look at that, so when you factor in the Danilo Gallinari injury, <clears throat> by the way, so that's just looming over all this. He's out for the season with an ACL um, injury. I've heard a lot of rosy things being said about Luke Cornett and Sam Hauser. Um, if you care to, my first question would be, what are your hopes for those guys? Or do you think that they're fit to play a bunch more minutes? And then does this team need to go out and get another front court body? Because there's, okay, maybe you have guys in your roster that you like, but Al Horford's 36. How many minutes do you want him playing? Do you want Grant Williams playing at the five? And so how do you envision them kind of sorting this all out, at least through that initial, you know, 12 plus week period without RW3? Oh, I mean, it's going to be hard. I mean, they're going to have to base there. I mean, they have to play Luke. Um, I'm assuming maybe Noah Bonley might make the team now um, just, you know, to add, to add additional depth. So maybe you have some, I was like all that. in on like, was that 2020 when Noah was on the Knicks? Maybe it was 2019. I was all in on that version of Noah Bonley. So if we rewind just, a few years, I might like this. Yeah. He, he, he just looks like he can play. You know what I mean? Some guys <laughs> just have that look where you're just like, Oh, look at him. He's so in shape. He just run up and down the court. He can do something, but I mean, it, it'll be hard. I mean, they like Luke Cornett. I, in the few minutes he's played with the Cel with the Celtics last year, um, he seems to be some of that at least position. He's he's positionally sound and he is really big, um, so that's a big part of the battle uh, defensively. Um, offensively, I don't really know what his role is. Um, he's not much of like a like a floor spacer. Mm -hmm. um, they're not going to have. I don't think they're going to be picking and popping him in the mid range. And I mean, we'll see how he is, but he could just be like a hard roller um, type of guy. So. It's limited. It's 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 limiting. I can see them getting creative, maybe having some more grant at the five, um, Luke for as long as they can, whatever whatever time. Al the Al the same way, and you just have to you know put together like a ragtag crew. Like I think you can do stuff like pairing maybe a guy like Noah Bonley with the Jays and and Brogdon and stuff like that. Just so you know, even when you're kind of like playing big with less talent, there's like so much running talent with them. That they just are able to play a more like a limited role. Um, but 
it'll be a lot of bandaging until Rob gets back. But you know, that's that that's a choice that they made for not going after. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, Blake Griffin too. He'll he'll play the five. I forgot about him. I forgot <laughs> I about him. Forgot about Blake Griffin for a second. Yeah, so he'll be another guy in in there getting whatever minutes he he can handle too. But I definitely think it's going to be a by committee, uh, by matchup type of deal. I am semi intrigued by Fiondu Cabangeli. Just feels like a shot of adrenaline when you watch him. But I'm just like. Once we get to that point, I'm just, you're right. It's going to be by committee. And so I, I hope I'm here for the Noah Vonley resurgence, although it might be a startup when you look at the, the rest of how his career has panned out. It's kind of, I think it speaks to how wonky an off season the Celtics had that it took me this long to get to Malcolm Brogdon. But how do you feel about that trade now that we've had a few months go by? And then what do you just think about his you know overarching fit on the team? I think it's actually scary how well he fits on the team. I feel like almost as a fan, I feel like I'm almost like a pitcher pitching a no hitter. I just don't want him to say anything. You know what I mean? Like you just don't want to jinx it because right. he's becoming even with the way he looks like in the in just in the preseason, the way he's just a connector, the way he can just move the ball, have somebody else that can do that type of stuff, push the pace. He just looks like such a seamless fit, and it's just like man, like. How are they going to survive the 35, 40 games that they're probably going to have to survive without him now? Because he seems very solidified. So um, basketball wise, like you see the fit, you could see him even being closing lineups, even with a healthy Rob, and um, which is saying something. Um, he could probably be in the starting lineup, but they're probably trying to like space out the talent, which is why he's not starting, I would assume. But man, he looks every bit. He he hasn't been shooting well in, in the preseason, but he's taking the right type of shots. He's creating a lot of open shots, especially for Sam Hauser. Um, so he's just a guy that's he's fitting in very seems like as advertised. It's just it's just a matter of how important does he get and how much does that start to matter when you start to factor in his his um, injury history, unfortunately. Yeah, that's true. They have to factor that in as well. And do you think just between him and Derek <clears> White <throat> that they now sort of have and now Gallo's gone, do they have enough like tertiary creation to be a more dangerous playoff offense to where maybe they don't have to rely on Jason Tatum as much. I mean, they're sure hoping like, if, right. if, I, I mean, if, if Brogdon can make it to the playoffs and he's healthy, then yes, I'd say yes. If he doesn't, um, it's a, it's a toss up. Like maybe, maybe Sam Hauser takes a step, you know what I mean? Uh, maybe something like, like maybe someone else is not on the roster right now or something like that steps up, but it would be like something like that. Right now, I think the the pass without answer being yes is Brogdon being healthy for playoffs. He's the one that he's the one that takes it. He definitely is better suited for that than Derek White because he's historically been a more reliable uh, shooter. Even though I think Derek White's definitely more disruptive on on defense. Yeah. Is there also still an element? You and I have talked about this so many times at this point. Neither of us fall on the side of the fence that Jalen Brown is this super robotic player. But is there still sort of a huge chunk of Boston's fate that hinges on him still? progressing as an offensive player where yeah we've seen him hit step backs he hits he shot like a really high clip on step backs last year he shot a really high clip on turnaround jumpers i think that stuff's valuable but does is the next frontier for him doing more as a passer maybe some more methodical um initiation for the offense involving others or is this kind of no if we're going to get there it's going to be because of we either get other players or it's because of these other players by committee dang i hate to bring it back to brogdon but i think a lot of that depends on him too because okay. if you have a healthy Brogdon going into the playoffs, he's going to be a big time but play handler, ball handler, um, playmaker. So you could probably you're probably going to want to have Jalen playing off of him more often. Okay. Uh, but if but if you don't have a guy like like Brogdon or some of those big playmakers, then yeah, you are going to need your you know like your second best player, a guy that might take the most on your team to make somebody else better. You know that is going to be important, and we did see during the playoffs there were stretches where even when he was having like good performances and good nights and stuff like that, um, it was just him. And the reason why it's like that is because he isn't really trading for others. Um, I think that's something that he wants to start doing and he sees himself as someone that can do that. Um, and I think for his personal development, maybe outside of the Celtics, that's something that he should still want to, you know, pursue if he wants to be like a number one um, at some point in, in, in his career. Uh, but right now, that's still the hardest jump in basketball to make. And it would be crazy to sit there and say after like six, seven years, oh, yeah, that guy's just going to figure that one out. He could because that's yeah. stuff you learn later in, later in your career. But it's not something I could like with confidence. Like, oh, yeah, that stuff could be next up. 
it's not like scoring and things you just get in the lab and practice the movements like that's feel that's knowing the game so it'll it we'll see but i do think um if they go into playoff skinny without brogdon um without some of their other playmakers they are going to need jalen to make that type of leap do you think even though his like, even his scoring offense is kind of misperceived <clears throat> maybe if it's even nationally where i think a lot of people still view him as just a a driver and shooter. And this is someone who we shot 59% on turnaround jumpers last year, 17 of 41 on step back threes. I'm not saying, I'm not saying he's your best bailout option, but his, be- his, his offensive armory, I still feel like it's a lot deeper, deeper than people are crediting him for. Or do you think like, I'm just overstating that? No, I'm sorry. Uh, my dog. Is no, good. Crazy. We love dogs on this podcast. <laughs> um, no, um, I would say that you're absolutely correct. Like, he has turned himself from maybe more of, like, what he started in the league with, like, a stationary 3 and D, which I like to remind people, so did so did, so did did Jason Tatum when he first came and started starting. He was not creating at that type of level. It was space in the floor, 3 and D. And I think Jalen has progressively grown and added and added to his game where, like, he is a complete self-creator now. And when he plays off the ball, it's, like, for the better of the team. It's not something that he needs to, to get his points. Um, so I think even going back to your playmaking question, a lot of that is a balance that he has to strike. Um, knowing that, yes, I do have this capability to create for myself, to be to to be like an engine for an offense and spurts. Um, but is that the best for the Boston Celtics right now? Um, or should I be looking to get Luke Cornette engaged, who hasn't touched the ball in a little bit? And let me try to get this guy a touch as well. I mean, and let me make this extra pass here, even though I'm open, this is a good shot for me, just so Grant can take that shot and feel good about himself. Um, that level of thing in the game, like at, on that level of the playmaker, I don't necessarily see it, but I don't necessarily think that's a problem on this team because he is such a talented offensive player and they do have so many, so much playmaking that I would still probably be okay if um, he just moved off ball. And I could easily see him taking like an off ball role um, and just playing, playing off these guys, and he would still be able to get his 20-plus. So ideally, I think um, the team is set up for him to, to kind of do that, and there's, a, there's less pressure for him to turn to a playmaker um, even because of the fact that he has grown so much as an offensive player. Do you glean anything profound from Boston's involvement of the Kevin Durant pursuit, or is it just like, oh, it was Kevin fucking Durant, and so we, we were involved? I mean, I don't know, right? Because, I mean, it clearly got to a level where, I mean, everyone knew that everyone else was talking about it, but nobody else had a report out where it was like Jalen Brown, Derek White, first round pick. You know what I mean? Like, right. there, no one, there's not many other teams um, that were that I were as good as the Celtics that had that type of level um, of offer, like, out there publicly, even though we heard Miami, Raptors, all the people, all of them had... Um, leveling interest so in my in my opinion i don't really know it seemed like it, it had maybe upset uh jalen no one asked eric white for Derek white no one asked him how he felt about it <laughs> about his name being in trade rumors um but i think as of right now from what we've seen on the court and what people have talked about at least publicly um there wasn't i don't i don't think anything will come of it i think kevin is okay and, and, and understands the landscape and I mean, the, the, the season started now, right? So, and I think because of the other news that happened, it kind of took away from that as well um, regarding Ime. So it could have been maybe something um, that, that, that stuff always had the possibility to maybe come up again when it comes back to contract extension time. And maybe like um, we saw that in Utah with uh, Gordon Hayward in, in a little bit of different circumstances when they right. made him go out and get his deal. It's not that it impacted him going for those next four years, but he remembered that. Uh, when it came time to free agency. So maybe for Jalen, that means, hey, if I make an all-NBA all team, do not expect to get a to get any type of discount from me. You know, you you clearly show me you, you would trade me. So yeah. I need I need the max contract. So maybe that's where it, where, where it actually impacted Celtics down the line. Yeah, so that, we'll and see. that's just what I was thinking, especially because there's going to be time for the, the speculation to fester because we know Jalen Brown is not going to sign an extension because the cap's going up and you can't even get to his max by extending him off his current number. And that's what I'm just because he was so yeah the the other the rest of the offer wasn't necessarily thrown out there but it was just so like freely 
flown around and you know Woj isn't necessarily writing that stuff unless it's like those dialogues have been happening no matter how you feel about Woj, Woj's reporting and so I understand players understand that it's a business but if I'm Jalen Brown just coming off the finals and hear my name mentioned in, in rumors this summer it just it it impacts me a little bit differently but I'm just soft and probably can't play and like I don't have a thick enough skin for it maybe but that's what I what you outlaid towards the end is exactly what I was thinking yeah yeah so I mean It'll see. It'll be something. And I mean, if 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 you're the Celtics and like you did actually have a chance at Durant and you stopped it at like Jalen or whatever, you really can't like you have to go all in on Jalen yeah. now. Like you can't sit there and then go, oh, well, you know, I don't want to pay you this and this. <laughs> it's like you you said no to Kevin Durant. You said no to right. Kawhi. You know what I mean? Like you cannot con- like you have to pay him. You have to. You have to. Get, you have to be comfortable with that. Uh do you Jalen Tatum? Uh, Jalen Tatum. Wow, Jason Tatum had a rough. <laughs> That'd be a great player. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jason Tatum had a rough NBA Finals. Do you actually take anything like consequential away from that, or was this very much just sort of like a young superstar first taste of the finals? There was definitely you know, some of the things, he, shots he passed up at points. Some of his finishing was all over the place. Um, is this just like getting his first taste of finals basketball also against a Warriors defense that was hellacious and totally geared towards just making his life absolute hell? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think there's been like a historical like blueprint of like some like the young stars coming in against uh, great dynasty teams. Uh, LeBron compared himself to Tatum's experience this, uh, this summer. So I think there's I think there's definitely I think there's definitely an element of yeah, this was like you did not play well at all. Um, but I think in the grand scheme of things for him and his career, um, I still think they were they were really gassed and they they were playing a team that knew what knew what they knew what to do, knew how to play. And he was going against a guy that, you know, a wing with very great length and, and Andrew Wiggins, um, who also wasn't being asked to carry the same offensive burden. So it wasn't mm-hmm. kind of the same as playing against Kevin Durant, where it's like, yeah, even though I'm defending you, like we're both carrying so much for our team, like it kind of evens out with Wiggins. Like his job is just shut down KD and play off my team. Right. And um, that's hard because he's a really good defender too. So um, I think the Warriors have been really great. They played him extremely well, but I think for Tatum, he'll ultimately like look at that as just a learning curve for his next, for his next step. And do you buy into the playmaking jump? Because when you go back and watch Jason Tatum's passing from last year, my fucking God, man, he, it feels like, he was materially different and a lot of the passes he were throwing were just so much more complicated and difficult than he was in, in even years past. And it's been probably like a linear progression too. I think we've talked about how he's kind of improved incrementally in past years. And so I'm fully <clears throat> on board it. And if this is someone who then like takes it to the next level, if he needs to, who knows if the Celtics need him to this season, when you have a Brogdon coming in, you have a full season of Derek white, not to mention Marcus Martin, uh, Jalen Brown as well. Uh, this is very much someone to me, who may have entrenched himself in that MVP tier of superstar. Yeah. I mean, I think that was like the last frontier for him and some of like the different differentiator between him and some of the best creators in the league is how well they were able to create for their team and how they could easily go into seven and 10 assists a game. Um, and I think we started to see that understanding for Tatum, learning how to leverage his like gravity, um, learning where his reads are. I think as the year went on, he actually even got more accurate with his passes where at first, he was he he has been able to make the read a long time in his career, but there's so much more to making the read, like knowing the timing down, knowing getting it in the shooting pocket every time, and different guys have different kind of levels where they like to touch the ball. Um, and you could even see on some of those passes, like look some of the assists to Pritchard versus Grant um, versus Al, you're seeing a guy that's understanding like his teammates and where his teammates like like to shoot it, like to shoot it, and like to get the ball as well. So for me. Um, I don't, that's not like shooting for me. I don't think that's, I don't think that's something that just falls off or comes, ebbs and flows. Cause that, those, that's a read and understanding of the game that you can make. You might not always get 10 assists a game, but you can always make that read. You always know where that read is. So I think his passing leap was real. I, and I would venture even as far to say, I think even with the extended uh, playmaking that they have on the team now, I think he's still going to see the ball a fair, a fair bit amount. And I fully expect him to be in the in the five to eight assists per game range uh, this year, and to have a couple of triple doubles on um, on, on 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 him this year. Ooh, triple doubles! How, did he have one last year? I can't remember. Uh, 
one, I think he's had one in, in his whole career, and it was it was pretty weak. Like he wasn't in control of the game. He just he fell into that. So this one, I want to see him actually control the game, actually get it. When you step back and look at this roster, um, is there a concern that you have? aside from, you know, RW3's health, and maybe even we talked on the front court rotation, that you don't think is receiving enough attention? I would say the overall health of the team should okay. be a great consideration. Um, you touched on Robert Williams. Um, we touched on Al Horford, who's, who's 36, right? Marcus Smart misses a lot of games. Malcolm Brogdon, you talked about, misses, misses a lot of games. The past two years, um, Jalen Brown has missed, you know, at least more than 10 games himself. Uh, Blake Griffin is pretty old. I don't think he'll be able to. He's not a guy that you're expecting to play all 82. Um, that's like half our rotation right there that has some type of varying, varying injury concerns. Um, so that staying together and being OK for a full season. I don't know. At some point, you know, there's going to be a time where I think Peyton Pritchard is going to start at point guard. Is how I feel like at some point of the year. So. Um, I think I think injuries could be the thing that you know makes or break this makes or break this team ceiling, um, and I don't think um, I think people see it from like the raw perspective and the Brogdon. I don't think people realize like it's a it's it's across the team that there's a at every position there's like someone that has had some type of recurring injury that um, that has required rest and who knows like you don't always get to time your injuries if you have Smart and Brogdon out at the same time like I was saying suddenly like your backup point guard is JD Davidson. <laughs> Things can happen like that. So that would be that that would, that would be my biggest concern right now. And also just Al Horford being 36 too and he's at, I think he was at 29 minutes last year and I just wonder early on if that number is going to have to be ticked up because of our W3 not being there. Ooh, uh, I hope not. I mean, they like Luke Cornett, so we'll see. Yeah. yeah, what is Brad Stevens' fascination with Luke Cornett? He's like loved him since the dawn of time. Man, one of his only likes, I guess he just likes very fundamental basketball. And, you know, it's funny, though, because the, the, the video he liked of Luke Cornett was not fundamental basketball. It was him trying to break down guys off the dribble. And, and, and it looked like a summer uh, 24-7 gym or something like that. So that was, that was very interesting. Maybe he just likes Luke. You know, guys have guys that they stand. Maybe Brad, maybe Brad is, a, is a Luke Cornett stand somewhere. So we should, we should expect, expect to see Luke Cornett grab and go. Run, run the floor, run the offense, uh, based off that liked video. That's all I'm. That's all I'm understanding. I mean, that's all we can take from it, honestly. <laughs> are there any? Does this team have any underrated strengths, um, or even hidden gems on the roster that you don't think are receiving enough attention heading into the season? Mm, everyone has the Sam Hauser point now, and I think everyone has kind of seen him a little bit. Um, but you know, I don't. Not not all your listeners are locked into Celtics Twitter, so. Sam Hauser is, is a shooter that they got last year undrafted. Um, actually stole him from, from the Miami Heat. It was those who were competing for his services. Um, he played he played in Maine a little bit, did, did really well, got a two-way. And last year before the year ended, they gave him his, his, his full contract. Um, he's a sniper, like legitimately. Uh, whether there's NBA length on him, no NBA length, like, lights out type of guy the type of guy that um you know gives you like little remnants of like Kyle Korver a little bit with, with just like his size and like the way he plays and stuff like that um so that type of shooting has never really existed with the Celtics core with the Jays um, especially now it's like now the type of playmakers that they have on the team the fact that they're at this age now where like they're kind of ready to win and see it having a guy like that that can just create so much gravity just from moving around constantly like that. I'm very interested to see what type of um, what type what type of like spacing and stuff like that 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 opens up for them. Um, so I think I think I think Sam Hauser is probably like Umo Uno. But I also think I also think Payne Pritchard is too. Um, I know he's very behind on the depth chart, but he's a hooper man. Like he can really really play. He shoots well. He's fearless. He's a good point of attack defender, even though he's not versatile due to his size. Some nifty handles too. Yes, and he's very shifty, very, very like kind of explosive within his moves. I just think he's a guy that um, playing around the type of talent the Celtics have coming into that year four and kind of having that confidence about him. I think he's gonna find his way on the court. Um, I think some people forget that, like even towards the end of last year, he was closing games over Derek White at times. Um, He's not someone that, you know, is just like a clear step below. Um, I think at times he might even warrant playing 
over some of those guys, like like a Derek White at times. So I think he's a secret guy that I think because the team doesn't have a lot of wings outside of the Jays, you could see them kind of get funky with some three guard lineups and he might end up being, you know, a bigger part of the rotation than 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 people imagine. So Payne Pritchard is someone Payne Pritchard and Sam Hauser, those are two guys who I think um can really like do some special things with the Celtics, just kind of playing off those uh those top core members. Yeah, Sam Hauser specifically, the, and like Jason and Jalen have never really played with someone like this. This like iteration of the Celtics, they've had good shooters, but like the functional complementary shooter who can just fly all over the place is not necessarily. I'm trying to remember, am I missing someone that they played with along similar lines? It feels like their first crack at it. Yeah, the closest thing with Evan Fournier. So, yeah. Okay. It's a good point. Um, Nick's legend, Evan Fournier. Thank you very much. Um, I I didn't ask this in the outline I sent, but Grant Williams, extension eligible, uh, been oddly quiet on that front. What would be, would you, one, do you expect an extension to get done or is this leak in restricted free agency? And if you had the opportunity to sign him, you're the Celtics, what would be your, your walk away number? Uh, my probably guess is that they probably want him around the same money as Rob, which is like, Rob was four four fifty two. It was like thirteen mil average um, out. So I think anywhere between maybe like twelve, um, thirteen be the perfect perfect amount. Fifteen is probably where you're like, mm, I'm I'm getting to my, I'm getting to my breakaway point. But I can still see them even going up to like sixteen, seventeen. But I don't think anything past like you start getting to seventeen, it's like the twenty mils and stuff like that. That's probably where you start like walking away in that range and. A lot of that just kind of depends on how people see Grant. Cause I think Grant probably sees himself as maybe more of like a versatile, like, like he's a four, but like he can play five, he can play three, like mm-hmm. he's up all over the court. Um, if people just kind of only see him as like just a front court guy, that could change how his, how, how his market is perceived. Um, I don't think it's a mistake that during this preseason, we're seeing him break out a lot of like hesitations and a lot of some of the stuff you saw at like Tennessee, some of the mid post games and stuff like that. I think he's trying to make a point um, within the within the offense because it hasn't looked selfish at all. But within the offense, he's trying to show that um, he's not just some three and D guy um, that can just you know maybe just like guard specially or something like that. Like he's someone that has a full arsenal game that can do some creating. And you know if the Celtics don't get a deal done and that ends up being true throughout a whole year, um, you know someone is going to throw him a lot of money. Mm-hmm. Um, that 18, 20 mil number now maybe that's somewhere where like he is getting. Um, so I think right now, right now, they probably think they can get him around like 12 to 15. Um, and it's just a matter of whether he's okay with that or he's willing to bet on himself and his work and think that maybe showing more self-creation going into this year, uh, will help raise his stock. But that's obviously, that's a, that's a tough game because you have a bad year too, you know, you end up, you know, maybe losing a lot of money at the same time. So we'll see, but. I think I think they'll get a deal done though. Yeah, and also the non-star big market can be weird. And Grant Williams is not your traditional big, but maybe some team. I think there are probably some teams out there that don't think he could play the five. There are probably other yeah. teams out there that don't think he warrants more like on-ball activity. Uh, if if the Celtics could get him for between twelve and fifteen, I think I'd do it on their part. But I'm, if I'm him, I might also roll the dice on myself, thinking, well. Rob's going to miss this time. My role's going to be elevated for at least, you know, a third or a half of the season. Maybe I get myself paid. So I, it wouldn't shock me if they don't get a deal going to say that, or I think some people might get sticker shock from what his deal is actually worth. Should they agree to an extension? Yeah. And I mean, the other proponent that I think it's also going to consider is like, if it gets like the 15 mil and stuff like that, within the context of, of the new TV deal, like that just might be like standard money for um, a core player. You yep. know, so I think they understand that. So to me, I think he's he's young enough. This is not his last deal where I think they can both kind of like give a little and meet around that like 15 mil number. Given the I mean, some of the injury concerns on this roster, the fact that they made the move for White last season, in the middle of the year, they make the move for Brogdon this offseason. They're in on some level on the KD discussions. Is this a team that you could see knowing how deep the East is if they're not sort of just in the thick of the title race again, they're they're a step behind or something that will continue to be aggressive in making trades. Um, they do have some mid trade exceptions that they could use as well. Or do you think that they they're very much sort of in? We need to see a full year from what we have from uh this group sort of mode. I think I think they'll make a deal because it's going to be a lot of opportunity. 
because there's a seven four alien coming out of the draft, and I think it's gonna make a lot of teams feel Great point. that are I, there's a lot of in the middle teams that might decide. You know, the plan is not for us this year. Uh, I think a chance that at you know what's ha- what's what, what's coming in this draft um, might be it might be more appealing than fighting, and I think because of that. I think there's going to be a lot of options for them. And they do have Gallo's contract who tore his ACL. And at mm-hmm. his age, you don't know how he's going to recover. You don't know what type of player he's going to be able to be after something like that so late in his career. Um, but it's like, you know, it's a good number, like six mil, something like that. Um, if you feel like you really need you really need some wing depth at this time, like you pair him with maybe like Pritchard, um, who I think is a good backup guard in this league um, for a team that's maybe just now ready to tank and stuff like that. That you know maybe they do something like that, but it, it I I think they'll it'll obviously be something like on a small scale. I think it's gonna be more of like um like a rotation guy, like something just to so more to solidify their floor than to raise their ceiling. So, I, yeah, this I isn't think. a team that's gonna try and like acquire a top six player now. Like they've done that twice basically with White and Brogdon. It's sort of if anything happens like that again, the Durant interest didn't throw me off, but their their strong links to it threw me off a little bit. Where it was oh, are they still sort of in? like this weird aggressive talent acquisition mode near the top of the roster. The So when you look at full strength, this team, the 10-man rotation, uh, it feels like there are probably, it might be eight locks with Smart, Brown, Tatum, Horford, RW3, Brogdon, White, and then Grant Williams. Would you agree with those eight locks for their 10-man yeah. rotation? Who? How would you flesh out the the final two, or how do you expect that to, to pan out? I think I think they're gonna play Cornette on top. I'm pretty confident in Cornette that I would almost even name him just someone just just wow. off of the fact that they need they need another center like they need someone else to blink twice if play. Brad Stevens is in the room with you right now. He's he's right here. You can't even see him. <laughs> he's just right here looking at me. Um, so I think I think he's gonna play, and then I think Howard is gonna play. But then, you know, when you start getting like eight, nine, I think in the regular season, maybe they're more liberal just just, just based off how it's going. Um, when it gets serious or it's maybe more competitive games, they probably go matchup based. Um, they have like Rob fully healthy. Maybe you're not going to see a lot of Cornette. They might just go a little bit more smaller with like Grant and uh, Blake and stuff like that. Um, so I would say for sure, I would think, I would say for sure in eight, um, Cornette's going to have to play out of necessity, so maybe nine. And then you're playing, or and then you're tinkering around with Hauser, Griffin, uh, Pritchard, um, and then maybe even you know having Yelly and Bonley just based off how things go. But uh, pretty much what I'm saying is the rest of that is probably going to be matchup dependent. When you do have White, Brogdon, and Smart all available, is that going to on a regular basis then squeeze Pritchard out of the rotation, or do you think there would still be room to to get him in there? It depends. It depends because uh, White and Brogdon are both pretty big guards. Um, mm-hmm. So depending on like what type of second second unit lineups they have, they play pretty small in the preseason. They even tried out like a Tatum at the five lineup. So if they go like a three guard lineup, for example, that might be the way to steal minutes. Um, but then again, you know, if Hauser shows himself, you know, to be a good shooter, able to kind of hold his own defensively, and maybe just that size is what ends up winning out most of the time. Uh, then maybe, you know, that does end up squeezing him out. But that's kind of where I go back to maybe it's going to end up being a matchup dependent type of thing unless someone really, like, shows themselves to be a player that has to play every night. This question's matchup dependent as well, but what do you envision as their <clears throat> go-to closing unit? Is it just in crunch time? Is it just going to be what the full strength starting five would be? Like, we should expect it to be that, or do you think there'll be some tinkering? You know, you could make it when you're looking at Rob and Horford, but then also you have these different guards in Brogdon and, and White as well. Oh, no, I think it'll be Brogdon over Horford, like, closing when it's, like, serious. And I think okay. they'll keep they'll keep Rob because um, Rob, is, Rob, they need Rob for the vertical threat. Obviously, the, ob- obviously the defensive ability and stuff like that. Well, some, of his, his, some of his own passing ability. But I definitely think it'll be Smart, Brogdon, Jalen, Jason, and Rob when it's, like, go time like season on the line whatever like that's going to be their lineup is there a weirdo quirky bonkers lineup that you want to see missoula try this year i do i do like um they have some weird lineups that can allow them to kind of play i like i like seeing this this might not be weird because it's like real guys but like i think there's some type of symmetry that can go on between brogdon 
Hauser, and Rob Williams. Because Rob is a little bit better in passing than passing people realize. Um, I think there's a lot of like type of like dribble handoffs, give and go action that him and Hauser can. And a lot of the bragging tape that you see is like him make, having a lot of chemistry with DeMontis Sabonis and him becoming like a completely great like pick and roll partner with him. Mm-hmm. Something I think something I think he can develop with Rob in different ways. And during the preseason, he's been, you know, Sam Hauser's bit, biggest benefactor. So I think starting off, I want to see those three. And then I'd want to have Grant in there. Ooh. And then I'd probably want to have another small guard like Pritchard. Just because I want to see like the intense floor spacing, just because of Pritchard being able to Pritchard being able to shoot from thirty, Grant being a marksman, then you have kind of like Robin there is like the the ultimate vertical threat, and then you have a pick and roll like Master and Malcolm Brogdon. So maybe like something like that. It's not really like Wong. It is kind of like traditional in that way, but just I think those collection of players would weirdly have like an interesting chemistry. I'm going to use Tatum spending time at the five in the preseason as the impetus for mine. I think, I think that was against the Hornets. Oh, that's the only teams they played against the Hornets as we're recording this. Forgot. (laughs) Um, I'm going to go with Tatum Brown Brogdon. And then I kind of want to put Sam Hauser in there. And then maybe we'll go with Marcus smart. I'm trying to think of how's the best way to flesh out a Jason Tatum. I would like to see Pritchard and just go all offense and soup it up. I know you said he can be an underrated point of attack defender, but I'm wondering if you need smart, more than Pritchard in, in the way that that lineup structure is. No, I mean, you need smart because you didn't have a center on the court. Now you, and now you have, you know, the ultimate center in Marcus Smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so as we're recording this, their win total over under is set at 53.5. I believe it dropped from 54 and a half to 53.5. Are you hitting the over or the under on that? And where do you think they stack up relative to the rest of the East as of right now? I think they're going to hit the over on it. I think with all the stuff going on, I think a lot they, uh, it's been pushing a lot of the focus just on the on basketball. Everything that everything that's coming out of them is how they're ready to play, how the continuity and kind of the chemistry they built last year feels like it's just coming right in to this year. And I think it could kind of be similar to kind of like the Suns where it's like they just came out that finals, they kind of figured something out. They know who they know who they are as a team. And they just kind of just come in and just play really hard in the regular season. So I think they're actually going to be over the over. I, w- I would put them even I- – I'll put them at like 55 wins. So 56 Holy ones, shit. I guess that's I not too far over. If you're going to go 53 yeah. and a half over, you might as well go to 55. Yeah. I would uh, – so like so like the 56 one, I would have gone under. But 53, I think they could, they'll go over that one. I, th- I think they were when I first noted it before the whole thing happened. It was at 54 and a half. So it did drop a win. I'm, I've been hitting way too many overs in this exercise. And with them, I'm just so unbelievably worried about the front court rotation and its fragility without RW3. And I'm I'm curious as to whether if we could see some defensive regression for half of the year without him and whether that winds up seriously repressing their their win totals. Where no, I don't think they're gonna be like 45 wins, but something like 49, 50, 51. Mm, that that's interesting. I mean, it's possible. It's very possible. Rob was a very special piece for them. I just, I don't know. I think regular season, it's so like teams really don't target your weaknesses as much. A lot of mm-hmm. it is just trying to do what they do best a lot of times. So for me, I just kind of feel like there's still enough talent for the Celtics that even missing Rob, the type of like spacing that they have now, the type of offense that they're kind of playing that's a little different than Emes. Joe's doing a little bit of different stuff. I think that's like enough that they're still going to kind of, for regular season purposes, still be able to be a contender so we had to be consistent and do that for kind of like a full year. That's, that's kind of where my, where I'm going with it. And I, I think, I think I kind of, you know, I don't, I think playing five, the, 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 the people that they have and play the five, I think for like three months, you know, if you want to put, if you want to put a lot on Al to start the year and then kind of wane him down to the second half of the year when teams are tanking, uh, new teams that didn't realize they were tanking starting to tank now it's a little bit lighter on the schedule maybe you start pushing his minutes down there and sitting him in the second then the back half of the year and play him heavy during the first first half so you're playing maybe 25 27 minutes just exclusively at the five then you know luke adds a little bit blake adds a little bit or bonley or whatever grant adds a little bit and you're able to kind of you know still get your 48 without it being too much of like you know, what many of us believe at this stage is still like below average NBA players. Yeah, that's a, I've, I've yet to sort of 
reconcile how there might be more available wins for the top of the East than I'm expecting if teams like Charlotte and Washington pivot into a tank. But I also then look at the East and I'm like, with Cleveland and Miami and Philly and Milwaukee, um, Toronto, whatever the hell Brooklyn winds up being, I'm not like too confident in Atlanta, but they're still really good. Those first like seven, eight spots in the East are just so jam packed with teams that are going to make it difficult to pick up wins. And I'm just curious whether that not the Celtics specifically, does that almost like create this parody of wins near the top of the East to where, Oh, does 53 like, or something win the East and like to come up with a one seed. Um, and so it's just, it's so tough for me to wrap my head around because it feels like the East from the middle to the top is just an absolute beast this year. It's true. And I think that the Heat were, I think, the first seed of 53 last year. So that's right. I thought they had 55 for some reason. You're right. And so, yeah. like, does 51 yeah. get the one seed this year or something? Yeah. Just like because those late season games against the Cavs and then presumably the Nets, like, are going to matter more. But then you can counter that with, well, Washington, Charlotte, maybe even Chicago looks pretty combustible. Um, I don't know what the Knicks are, to be honest with you. Um, it's, it's just fascinating. I, they're still, the Celtics are still near the tippy top of the East for me, but. It feels like it's almost, or it doesn't feel almost, it does feel like it's going to be tougher to come out of this year than it was last year. Oh, uh, I, I, for now, you know, from what we have right now, I, I, I completely agree. I uh, just think, yeah, it's too much talent, way too much talent. Alex, this, did I not ask you about anything that you think it needs to be covered with regards to this team? Hmm, man, I feel like there's been so much coverage being a finals team. I can't even think of an angle that has not been hit. Um, yeah, man, I also want to talk about our second two-way spot, Justin Jackson, Bordick, Bordick Thomas. <laughs> I don't want to put your sleepers to sleep, but I think, yeah, I mean, that's the biggest point. Can they stay healthy? Um, can they survive without Rob? And let's see if Joe Mazzulli can coach an NBA team. Alex, this was great. As always, I appreciate you being so generous with your time. In case anyone skipped the intro, are you able to tell our listeners where they can find you? Uh, yes, uh, you can find me on my Twitter handle. That's uh, K-U-N-G-U underscore NBA um, with the season up and running. Um, I'm looking forward to posting about it. And I think I think this year I'm going to be guest writing at a couple of places. So hell yeah, out over there. Hell yeah. Always enjoyed you when I got to read you. So that's that's exciting to hear. Go follow this man. He's also, as we know now, pro dog. So that's another reason to go follow him. Um, thank you so much, Alex. And as you know, I will be spamming your DMs again in the future. Oh, no problem. Hopefully for good news. <laughs> <laughs>